in that press conference, I told you everything I could ethically tell you. And at that time, because it was before trial, it was very limited. It was what charges that we had filed and how much time they carried and things like that. I wanted to make sure that I followed the rules to be ethical and also to ensure that the Wests would have a fair trial. And that exactly is exactly what happened. They had a fair trial and there was a fair verdict. Shortly after uh, the indictment was read and even before the defense had access to any transcript or knew even a shred of evidence, the accusations started coming. The first was that this prosecution was politically motivated. And I can tell you that is the furthest from the truth. This case was prosecuted because the evidence was overwhelming that Trezell and Jacqueline West murdered those two boys. As the case progressed during the months that came, the defendants quickly and repeatedly sought to attack law enforcement in a failed effort to cast doubt in what was one of this county's most exhaustive, thorough investigations. And I'm very proud of the work that law enforcement has done in this case. Having finally reached the conclusion of the trial process, I can assure you that while the world was wondering what happened to these children, your Kern County law enforcement officers and the prosecutors involved in this case were working tirelessly to seek evidence in order to hold the defendants accountable. I'm very pleased with the verdict in this case. I am so grateful for the jurors who chose to serve and who were patient and diligent with the evidence. Today, the jury, um, today the judge uh, sentenced both Jacqueline and Trezell West for 15 years to life on the second degree murder of Sincere and also a child, felony child abuse for Classic, which was four years consecutive for a total of 19 years to life. As you are aware, the jury was unable to reach a verdict on two counts, and those dealt with the uh, murder of Classic. Mr. Smith and I made the very difficult decision of choosing not to retry the case based on those two counts. There was a lot that went into that, a lot of thought, time and effort, but ultimately we decided not to go forward and retry the defendants on those counts because of uh, the major factor was the difficulty that would have put the witness through. As you know, uh, the majority, uh, not the majority, but uh, uh, some of the most impactful testimony was from children, it was from the children in the home, and it was very difficult on them, and uh, in essence, they had to testify against their parents. We didn't want to put them through that again. The children were murdered in September of 2020, but reported missing three months later on December 21st of 2020. And that made the investigation very difficult. In essence, the killers got a three month head start on law enforcement. But about one week, the children were taken into protective custody on the 21st and about a week later, it was, uh, we discovered in law enforcement what had happened. We received the evidence at that time, what had happened, and that the children uh, that, in essence, um, Sincere was killed in Bakersfield, never made his way to Cal City, and that Classic may have been there for a couple of days, then disappeared. So we knew that. That's not something I told you early on. But you may ask, why did you not begin the indictment process for nearly a year? I can tell you because we worked and law enforcement worked. 
and they worked hard. They interviewed numerous witnesses. They conducted numerous searches. 47 search warrants were conducted in this case during that period of time, looking just looking for all evidence in this case, but looking to see if there was any evidence at all that would have shown that those children were alive after September of 2020. A photograph, a video from the business, anything, and there was nothing. And during the trial, the defense was able to produce nothing to show that those children were alive after September of 2020. I want to thank law enforcement for their work in this case. They did an amazing job. They were persistent. They were diligent. Specifically, I want to thank the California City Police Department that started this. They got the call that two children were missing. And what did they do? They assumed they were alive. And they did everything they could do to try to find them. But soon it became uh, clear that the killers were not telling the truth about what happened. When we discovered one week into the investigation that Sincere was killed in Bakersfield, the case then primarily went to the jurisdiction of the Bakersfield Police Department. Chief Terry and his staff and all the investigators in the case, they were wonderful. They fully accepted, of course, the responsibility because it was, uh, he was killed in their jurisdiction and they took over the investigation and they worked so hard. And um, I went to meetings there where there were just rooms full of, uh, a room full of detectives working on every aspect of this case. And uh, I was very proud to be a part of that. I'd like to also thank the Kern County Sheriff's Department. They helped in a number of ways, as did the California Highway Patrol and the FBI. When you have two little children that are missing, four years old and three years old, it just breaks your heart. And then to find out that they were killed by the people that the state entrusted to take care of them is just heartbreaking. This was a case that was so hard because it was so sad. I mean, all homicides are sad, but goodness gracious, these four year, the four year old, they were babies. They were babies. And I am so proud that the community embraced these children and cared, and cared about this case and followed this case. I also want to thank all the volunteers in Kern County and other places that came out to search for those children out in the desert, hoping that they were alive. And I want to thank everyone that watched this case, even though you may not have been involved, that you had hoped and rooted that uh, there would be a just ending to this. It's not the ending that we hoped. I mean, it would have been wonderful that these children were alive, but they are not. But we, at least we were able to achieve justice for these children. Now, the bodies of Sincere and Classic have not been found. But we will never give up hope that the bodies of these precious children will be found and can be brought home. So at this time, I'd like to turn the mic over to Eric Smith. Eric Smith has been, uh, is the, was a trial attorney on this case. He's the chief trial deputy in this office. Uh, he and I have been together and uh, on this case since the beginning, and he took over as trial attorney uh, pretty early on during the investigation, knowing at some point we were going to file charges. So, um, Eric, would you like to say something, a few words? All right, good morning. Uh, it's been one of the honors of my career to be able to prosecute this case. I've never met, obviously, sincere and classic, but I went in every day to, to fight for their justice because they deserved it. Uh, they were provided to Jacqueline Trezell by the state, and ultimately they were not treated appropriately and they were killed by them. Uh, this has been a, a long road. It's been a long road that involved a lot of people working extremely hard. And some of the, uh, I guess, unsung heroes I like to bring to the forefront are, the jurors. The jurors, they go and they call the jury duty. They don't know what they're there for. And ultimately, they get picked for a panel. And, and in front of them is a case that has over 70 witnesses, has over 100 pieces of evidence. And they deliver, uh, deliberated thoughtfully. 
Uh, they deliberated about this case and ultimately they rendered uh, justice for Sincere and Classic. I'd also like to thank the other family members in the West family, uh, Wanda West, Philip West, Josiah West. A lot of times in these cases, family members are collateral damage. Um, ultimately, when law enforcement goes out, they talk with family members of suspects. And in this case, those individuals, Wanda, Philip, and Josiah, were truthful. They provided the truth in this case. That's something that's extremely hard to do when it's your son that's looking at a prison term or being accused of murder. They provided that to law enforcement in the beginning, and they did that throughout. Uh, they testified to it. Something extremely difficult to do, but they did it. And also, of course, I'd like to thank law enforcement. I worked very closely with uh, Detective Thomas Hernandez, uh, with Chief Hightower and his uh, in, uh, officers. I just thank them for all their efforts in this case, for ultimately the justice that was served in this case for Sincere and Classic. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to introduce Assistant Chief of Police from the Bakersfield Police Department, Brent Stratton, and also the lead detective in this case, Tommy Hernandez. Thank you. Good morning. The Bakersfield Police Department is dedicated to pursuing justice on behalf of our victims, their families, and our community. That's evidenced by the tremendous amount of work and time and effort that went into the investigation of this case. We'd like to recognize and Thank DA Zimmer uh, for her leadership and her partnership with the Kern County District Attorney's Office. We'd also like to recognize Mr. Smith and the amount of work and effort that, that went into prosecuting this case. We'd also like to thank and recognize Chief Hightower and the California City Police Department as well as the Kern County Sheriff's Office and the FBI for the tremendous amount of assistance and work that, that went into this. But I'd also specifically like to recognize the investigators uh, led by Detective Hernandez and numerous other employees at the police department. DA Zimmer spoke about the, the sheer volume of people that put time and effort and their hearts into this investigation. Um, it, it was uh, a tremendous honor um, and I'm proud to, to work with detectives and investigators like them for the work that, um, that they put into it in, in seeking justice. I would like to say that the Bakersfield Police Department, however, will not rest until these boys are brought home and they're able to be laid to rest with the respect and the dignity that they deserve. Thank you for your time. And standing with uh, Assistant Chief Stratton is um, Detective Tommy Hernandez, who is a man of few words, but I can tell you who is a very hard worker and uh, has worked since uh, December of 2020 on this case. And finally, I'd like to introduce to you California City Chief of Police, Jesse Hightower. Good morning, thank you. Uh, leave it to Chelsea. And Channel 17. <laughs> so I'd like to start off by thanking the DA's office one, for having the courage to take this case, and then secondly, having the faith in the job that my organization, Bakersfield PD's organization, uh, the amount of work that was able to get done. Uh, I'm forever grateful to Mr. Smith, to Ms. Zimmer. Um, I'd like to thank the members of my community for coming out countless of hours, doing hundreds of searches through hundreds of miles. Uh, sometimes that terrain was pretty tough. Uh, and mostly I'd like to thank the members of my organization for their, they never quit. They always put forth 100%. So again, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chief. Um, it's a very sad case, but I am so proud of the work law enforcement did in bringing justice to these kids. It's, uh, it was quite a road and uh, we're, I think we're all relieved that it's over. But now, do any of you have any questions? Yes, uh, one of the accusations, um, you were talking about them earlier, was your office infringing on the client's rights by calling for a gag order immediately after the press conference in March. Now, what is your reaction to this? Okay, that's a lot of questions in one. Um, we thought it was appropriate 
Yeah, uh, I'm going to let Mr. Uh, Smith talk about how there was no infringement on anyone's rights and how gag orders are constitutional. Right. In, in the types of cases that involve media, where media is interested in it, at that and the media was interested in this case, um, a lot of times we will get gag orders. Uh, in this case, uh, following the defense attorneys having uh, a press conference, at that point we believed we needed to ask for a gag order. And the purpose of a gag order is merely that the parties don't speak uh, about the case with the media, and that allows for the uh, jury, as when they come, to be unbiased and not have knowledge of the case. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Cindy, I didn't know if you could give us just kind of a narrative of what exactly happened the, the night of uh, Sincere's death and then the, the following week, just how it took place, who you believe inflicted the fatal injuries of, of Sincere and then of Classic. I, I know a lot of it's apparently still unknown, but I didn't know if there's kind of a narrative you can give us of that. Are you asking what really ha what we really think happened yes. oh, outside of what happened in court? Yes, I know there was a lot said in court, but yes, I, I didn't know if you could tell us what you really think happened. Well, I think, you know, obviously Sincere was killed first in Bakersfield, and then I think Classic survived for a period of time until he went to um, Cal City, maybe just for a few days. Um, I'll let Mr. Smith talk about that and what he's comfortable. We don't want to, you know, speculate too much because some of this is just our gut feeling. But I think that after, and this is maybe Mr. Smith's opinion, but my opinion is after Sincere was killed, that Classic was lost. They were four and three years old, and they were together since birth, different foster homes, different places, and without Sincere, Classic was probably crying a lot. Um, you know, devastated, probably looking for him, and they had to come up with something to, to take care of that. I, I don't know, uh, but I just feel that I, I think about Classic and what it was probably his only real security was sincere, you know, being that they were together and, you know, biological brothers, and I think it must have been horrible to be without him for that period of time. And so above that, you know, maybe Mr. Smith, I don't know, we're, we're usually not very comfortable commenting on what a gut feeling is because, you know, who knows, uh, but I think we laid it out pretty well in court. Mr. Smith, is there anything you'd like to answer about that? I think he's probably more hesitant than I am about so you hesitant. Mm -hmm. Yes. In but, your interaction, um, have either of you had, or your office, um, with the biological family? Well, we have had quite a bit of interaction with the biological family. Uh, different members. Uh, Mr. Smith can tell you specifically a little bit more than I have, but they have been involved in this and for the most part cooperative and wanting to see justice done. What advice do you have for <clears throat> There's a lot of families that have taken custody of children uh, at the state level um, when it comes to the ties and abuses that took place here. Um, what advice do you have for them when it comes to making sure they're trying to prevent this kind of abuse? And if they do, or, and that they are abusing these children, that you know, the full weight of, you know, the county and the kind of efforts that you're talking about are, are, are standing behind those kinds of abuses. Well, I can tell you this, whether you're in an adoptive home or in your bio parents' home, uh, law enforcement in the county of Kern is not going to stand for child abuse. These are our most vulnerable victims. Do I have a message for adoptive parents? No. I think adoptive parents, uh, you know, are, are wonderful for the most part. But if anybody is ever feeling that they are, um, you know, losing it, losing their patience, maybe feeling that they were, you know, acting in an abusive manner. There's a child abuse hotline, and if anybody out there sees anything that they think um, is potentially abusive with a neighbor or relative or whatever, they can also call 911 or the child abuse hotline. Yeah, I mean, people can get help for this, you know. No, no parent is perfect, but of course we're not going to tolerate any type of abuse or murder, of course. We heard a lot about how difficult it could be to try a murder without a body. Mm -hmm. How difficult did that turn out to be now that we're done? Well, it might have been easier for us uh, if the bodies had been found. But there, it's, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not common, but it's certainly not rare. Uh, even if the bodies had been found, they might not, they might not have shown what the cause of death was, uh, depending on what the level of de decomposition was. So um, we've tried them here before. Uh, law enforcement actually gets trained in what we call no-body homicides. 
and um, I don't know. Would it have been easier? I don't know. It just it just kind of depends. But it uh, it wasn't going to deter us because you know this is different than a situation when you have an adult that is missing. You know, an adult can run away, be under an assumed name, you know, something like that. So we have to be, you know, well, we're careful regardless, but these were children and they would not have been able to provide for themselves. So it was pretty obvious something horrible happened to them uh, at that time. You said that you want to, that you will continue to look for their bodies. What exactly does that entail? Are, are there any leads or anything that you guys have to go off of where they might be? No, I don't believe so. Tommy, do you have any sure. leads? Of not, not at this time. We investigated all the tips, all the leads in that period of time before we uh, went to the grand jury and then during the trial. But I will tell you that um, uh, people find bodies, you know, in the desert. People find bodies, and luckily now we have DNA. And if and if the body is found, the body is one or, or both of them that we have the technology to be able to identify them, and I pray that those bodies are found. Going off that question, just to clarify, does that mean there won't be any active searches or any active actions? There certainly will be active searches, and perhaps uh, Chief Stratton can talk about that if there is a viable lead or tip. But right now, that's we don't have any. And of course, that these killers choose to do the right thing and come forth and tell us where they are, because the people that know where the bodies are are Giselle and Jacqueline West. And if they want to truly do the right thing, they should tell us where those children are. If you were to find them, could that somehow impact the sentencing or could we be back in court? I don't think so. This may be going to gut feeling again, but is oh. it? <laughs> I know. Uh, do you believe that Jacqueline was the killer of both boys? Do you believe Jacqueline killed one, Trizelle killed another? I just didn't know if you who physically killed the boys? I, I think I, I, I have my own gut feeling, but I don't know that that's appropriate. Mr. Smith, do you? I, I think we think they were in it together. They're like this. But uh, Mr. Smith, do you want to say anything about that? No. Nope. No. Uh, this is maybe directed towards Mr. Smith, because I know the family was speaking to you about it after the sentencing, but um, you know they were, they were really hoping to be able to say their piece and read their victim impact statements right. to Jacqueline and Trezell, and obviously that didn't take place. Do you know why that didn't happen today, or what happens with these kinds of statements? Right, and, and what we had them do is they wrote their statement, and because it, ultimately it's for the court to consider. Um, I understand their desire to address the court and then also be heard by Trezell and Jacqueline West, but ultimately they were heard by the court. The court read all of those uh, statements that they wrote and ultimately imposed the sentence that he did. So they were heard by the court. What resources uh, from the Victim Services Office have been made available to the family? Um, the victim advocates would know that answer about what type of services they availed, you know, chose to avail themselves of. It's not something that I would feel comfortable talking to you about as, oh, this family member needed counseling, this family member, but we have a, a, a lot of services that victims' family members can take advantage of, and I hope that they did choose to do so. Cindy, have you seen probation granted in a, for a murder conviction before? And what was your reaction to that argument in court? I have not seen that. The case that she mentioned, I don't think that the person was convicted of murder. I have never seen that. I've never seen a judge in Kern County give a probationary sentence. Um, I was offended, quite frankly, by the defense argument in court trying to paint Jacqueline West as the victim. Now, you know, defense attorneys are going to say what they're going to say. You know, they're looking out for the best interest of their clients. But that was, um, I think, went over the line. Jacqueline, you know, West, Trezell West, they were not victims. They were murderers. So, uh, and I did not believe Judge Bremer would grant probation for the murder of two children. All right, one more question? Or are we... We sufficiently answered all your questions, except the gut feelings that, you know. <laughs> I, we could turn around on you. You watched the whole trial. What are your gut feelings? Yeah. Why don't you, uh, <laughs> why don't you talk about that? No. 
All right. Again, I'm. Uh, is there anything else any of you would like to comment on? Thank you. Thank you all so so very much for coming. I appreciate it. And uh, again, I'm just so proud to be part of the law enforcement community uh, in Kern County that works like this to see that justice is in, is done in such a horrible case. Thank you.